Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Delighted that you are joining us today. My name is Owen Lewis. I'm co-chair of the IIEA's Climate and Energy Working Group. Today, I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar on sustainable forestry and how it may help address the crises of climate change and biodiversity loss. Uh, this event is co-organized by the IIEA and the Embassy of the Republic of Latvia in Ireland. And I want to particularly thank the Embassy for their generous support and assistance in helping to facilitate today's seminar. Forests, as you know, serve uh, really important and diverse roles in tackling the twin crises of biodiversity loss and climate change. They capture and remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, provide clean water and air, protect soils, halt habitat loss. The planting of larger, healthier and more diverse forests will be needed if the EU is to realise the target of 55% net emissions reduction by 2030. Today, we are fortunate to be joined by two distinguished speakers, Yvonne Slingberg, um, Director for Strategy, Analysis and Planning at the Director General for Climate Action of the European Commission, and Arvid Uzols, Director of the Forest Department in the Ministry of Agriculture, the Republic of Latvia. Um, we were to uh, be joined with a third speaker, Dr. Helen Ding, but sadly, illness has intervened. Um, we're planning to uh, split today's uh, session into, into three parts. Um, both panelists will first offer some remarks and we'll have a short discussion and then turn to your questions. Um, you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, you should see this on uh, towards the bottom of your, of your screen. Um, I'd encourage you to send your questions throughout the sessions as they occur to you. And it would be helpful, I think, if you identified yourself and any affiliation when you ask a question, please. Um, today's presentation and the Q&A session are on the record, and you should feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. Um, let me introduce our first speaker. Yvonne Slindenberg is Director for Strategy Analysis and Planning and Acting Director of Innovation for a Low Carbon Resilient Economy in the Director General of Climate Action. Previously, she was Director with Responsibility for International Affairs, served as Senior Advisor in the Cabinet of the Commissioner for Climate Action and Energy. And before this, she was Head of Unit for the Implementation of the uh, EU Emissions Trading Scheme. Um, Yvonne, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Owen, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. So thank you very much for inviting uh, the European Commission to, to participate in this session. Uh, you already mentioned quite a few uh, buzzwords that I'm afraid I will be repeating to, to a large extent. But basically, uh, today, very happy to talk about the fact that, you know, uh, indeed, climate change and biodiversity loss are independent. They make each interdependent, I should say, they make each other worse. Um, and that, of course, then means that we need to address these challenges in, a, in an integrated manner uh, and try to find uh, solutions that basically deliver multiple benefits. And, and here, of course, typically we, we think of nature-based solutions. Um, if we then break that down, it means that, you know, the land and the forests we have are under strong pressure of uh, the biodiversity and the climate crises. Uh, it basically means that our carbon sink in forest is decreasing. Um, and many of our forests are in no good state at all. You know, They're, the conservation of the carbon in there is, is really not good. All this exacerbated by, unfortunately, uh, continuing uh, adverse effects of climate change. Uh, they lead to 
you know, uh, pretty much unprecedented damage uh, risks. And, and here we can think of pests, but also fires, uh, diseases, etc. Now, at the same time, fortunately, uh, the forests are also uh, a solution or can be to biodiversity and, and climate, um, you know, the, the situation we're in. You already mentioned uh, forests absorb uh, carbon emissions and, and they give us fresh air, uh, they purify the water, and, and they, of course, in themselves also hold a lot of essential species. So the forest is multifunctional, um, and that is what the management of the forest then also needs to be. So if we try to uh, define sustainable forest management, this is all about safeguarding the health, but also the productivity of the forest, uh, providing you know, a contribution to climate action, uh, which means reducing emissions, enhancing carbon removals and, and better adaptation, basically better resilience, and to then also uh, protect the, the biodiversity that is in the forest. All that while uh, securing the, the long-term availability of uh, you know, the, the biomass, the renewable energy, and of course also wood materials. Now, uh, indeed, one of the things I wanted to talk about is the forest strategy that was uh, proposed by the European Commission uh, last summer. Um, and this is really was intended to, to find its anchor in both uh, the EU biodiversity and the climate strategies, huh? and to really kind of, you know, look at the specific role of forests in Europe for the future in that context. So uh, in our view, the strategy is pretty crucial uh, in terms of underpinning, uh, you already said it, uh, Owen, you know, the, the 2030 climate targets that we have, the minus 55%, but also of course, to become climate neutral in 2050, uh, where it has been clearly recognized that, you know, we will need to increasingly rely on uh, forest things to, to actually get there, huh? to have this balance between emissions and carbon removal, so to become climate neutral uh, mid-century. Now, uh, in the strategy, we have tried to, to put forward and to promote the most climate and biodiversity friendly forest management practices. Um, emphasizing uh, the need, again, to keep the use of woody biomass within boundaries. So how do we ensure the sustainability of that? Encouraging uh, resource efficient wood use. Um, it is also accompanied by specific actions. And there, for example, we have put forward a roadmap for planting 3 billion additional trees across Europe by 2030. Again, in, in full respect of uh, what we call ecological principles. So we need to make sure that we have the right tree in the right place and, and, and for the right purpose, if you want, but also taking into account uh, the changing climate that will inevitably be with us, however hard we work and continue to work on reducing emissions. Now, um, just to, to spell it out, I mean, biologically diverse forests and more varied forests are going to be more resilient to climate change that is around us. A more biodiverse forest is, is simply healthier and therefore fulfills better its functions also, uh, for example, as, as a carbon sink. Now, uh, again, this um, sustainable forest management and, and the multifunctionality of the forest in the EU is, is really what uh, is at the heart of the forest strategy. Um, the main objective being that you know we want to work together towards uh, ensuring that the EU's forests are well continue to grow, that they're healthy, diverse, and resilient, um, and thereby contribute you know to to these biodiversity and climate objectives that we mentioned before, but also securing livelihoods and of course you know uh, especially in rural areas, and to also um, make the, the bioeconomy that we do very much advocate a sustainable one. Now, for all that, um, one of the uh, tools or, or how to say, you know, a very important element in, in how to ensure this uh, sustainable forest man management is also better monitoring of forests. In our view, that is really uh, an essential 
step. Uh, it means that we have, as part of the strategy, uh, committed to make a legal proposal uh, on the monitoring, reporting, and data collection on forests. We will make that proposal uh, next year. Um, and again, harmonized and comparable uh, EU data um, combined with, you know, or, or being used then with uh, for strategic planning uh, at member states level, this should then provide a comprehensive picture of the current state, the expected evolution, and basically, you know, the, the future developments of forests in the EU uh, using the most modern technologies. And that kind of comprehensive picture is paramount to make sure that the forests can, again, you know, deliver on these multiple functions for climate biodiversity and, and the economy and not look at it in silos. Now, um, our intention is to uh, create incentives, to try to create incentives to preserve and enhance the forests, both qualitatively and quantitatively. Now, uh, what does that mean? It means that we will try to put in place, you know, uh, support schemes for ecosystem services like carbon six also uh, sometimes called carbon farming. Um, and yeah, these kind of incentive structures should of course very much uh, take into account also the biodiversity concerns, uh, but basically would then make sure that we use the public budgets uh, as efficiently as possible and, and you know, uh, have a clear objective of growth, jobs, but also innovation uh, as part of the, the bioeconomy. Now, um, to do all that, to, to, to work towards these, uh, these incentive schemes, we will also, I think it's at the end of this year, uh, come forward with a legal proposal on uh, the certification of carbon removals, because that will give the, the necessary uh, legal certainty you know, and, and robust rules uh, that we need in order to really capitalize on these opportunities for uh, innovation in, in the bioeconomy sector. Now, um, that was to, while I was zooming in on the forest strategy, there are many other uh, policy areas and, and instruments that are relevant here. So if you allow me, I will also go a little bit into those. Um, and that is, again, if you look at the fact that, you know, we need to have carbon removals contribute to our climate goals. Uh, whereas today, the state of, of the carbon sink uh, in Europe frankly, is quite worrisome. So that is something we need to stop. We need to reverse it, huh? this decreasing trend of carbon removals from the land use sector, uh, because otherwise we are not going to get to this uh, climate neutrality. And that is where we have now, as part of our uh, revision of an existing uh, legal instrument, uh, revision of our land use, land use change and forestry regulation, we have proposed to uh, write in the legislation an EU-wide target for net carbon removals of uh, minus 310 million tons of CO2 equivalent by 2030. So we had commitments uh, in, in the current legislation before this review, but it was to, to keep things stable and not, not to have a decline. Whereas now we're really putting on the table, you know, increase in ambition in terms of how much carbon we, we store in land and in forests. Uh, and all this, again, in view of, you know, uh, getting on track towards climate neutrality in 2050. Now, an EU level target is all very nice and good, but how do we get there? How do we make sure we meet that target? That means that, you know, all member states will need to contribute to that and they will need to play their part uh, in reaching those targets uh, to do so as efficiently as possible. Um, and to do that, we have actually also made proposals to, to have some changes in you know, the rules uh, and the targets for, for the different sectors as part of the forestry and land use uh, sector for 2030. Now, uh, in our view, um, that means you know, if, if we manage to capture this necessary transition of the sector, it would really provide a kind of a win-win solution on, on climate, uh, biodiversity, and the bioeconomy. So we have tried to put forward uh, simplifications of what we have in terms of compliance rules. Um, 
better use of the digital technologies, as I mentioned before, to really have you know all member states uh, using state of the art uh, monitoring tools, both for the uh, for the emissions and for the removals, and then um, basically to work together towards this enhanced ambition, as I said before. Now. We need to, uh, it's always, I don't know to which extent you are familiar, but when we make uh, EU policy and legal proposals, what is your baseline? You know, that is always a very important question. So we have for our LULUCF proposal, that's the acronym LULUCF, uh, we have used as a starting point um, the, the reported uh, state of play or the reported net removals uh, of each member state over the years 2016 to 18, those are the most recent data we have. So that is the starting point on how we have then uh, shared out the targets for over the member states. Um, we have then kind of looked at, okay, how feasible is it for each member state to contribute to this increased ambition? And there we have looked at, you know, um, the, the size of, of uh, the area of managed land uh, because that is kind of a good proxy to say, okay, a, a member state has a lot of land, so there is potential to do more. And that also means that, you know, larger member states will uh, have to basically lead in this increase of carbon removals across the EU in order to get to climate neutrality. Now, um, just to keep in mind, I mean, again, the climate policy framework is, is, is uh, quite, how shall I say, you know, rich. Um, we have specific action on forest and land, but we also have, uh, and you heard it, I've been responsible for that in the past, we have an emissions trading system that looks at the energy sector and at uh, manufacturing industry. But in between those two, we have uh, the remaining sectors where we have an effort sharing regulation that applies to those where also member states have national targets. And these uh, sectors covered there is basically agriculture, agricultural emissions, uh, transport, buildings, and waste. And what we have built is flexibility uh, between uh, what member states do in terms of action on land use and forestry and those other sectors uh, to basically, you know, not have too much uh, of a straitjacket in terms of uh, achieving or member states achieving each of their targets. We do have binding national targets in, in those other sectors that are under the effort sharing uh, legislation, but uh, there is flexibility you know, on how to achieve all this and, and the linkage to the, um, to the effort that needs to be made in the land use, land use change and forestry sector. Now, I thought maybe it could be interesting uh, to talk a little bit about Ireland um, because yeah, if you look at the uh, land use, land use change and forestry target for Ireland, it has been set exactly in this way. We look at the average 2016, 2018 uh, greenhouse gas uh, balance basically on land and have uh, put that against, you know, the share of, of uh, managed land and if you look at the outcome of that, it means that uh, the target for Ireland is that there can still be a net emission even in 2030. But again, clearly uh, it means that other member states will have to go towards these uh, negative millions of tons and increased carbon removals in order to, to put us on the track towards uh, you know, our goals 2030 and also 2050. Now, what I want to emphasize is that in our view, Ireland does have significant possibilities in this sector. Uh, there is, you know, a very high prevalence of grasslands, um, relative large areas of carbon rich peat soils, and also a very well established network of biodiversity rich hedgerows. Now, uh, you will have heard of a, a very important instrument, certainly in, in budgetary terms, but also in policy terms uh, at EU level, which is the common agricultural policy. So there we have a very important instrument um, that can help to put in place the necessary practices to decrease uh, emissions from agriculture in Ireland. Well, emissions from agriculture, but also from land use. And here, what, what can it be? I mean, these improved practices, it can be improved nutrient management. It can be improved efficiency of enteric formation in livestock. 
and also reduced ammonia emissions from you know manure etc um and then those are kind of like the headline <laughs> uh, practices that that will really need to be uh, looked at and improved but you can also think of halting peatland degradation uh, on the other hand you know rather increasing the protection of peatlands uh, increasing coverage of, of of trees you know by trees so basically afforestation improving grasslands and heathlands habitats and also promoting organic farming so there will need to be a discussion and i think this is quite lively uh, already for a few years now in ireland on how to uh, you know work within the agricultural sector but also with um, the, the land use land use change and forestry uh, side of the equation how to reduce emissions overall how to uh, enhance the carbon sink now, just one more element I would like to touch upon is uh, at the end of last year, in December, we, the Commission, the European Commission, adopted a communication on what we call sustainable carbon cycles. This is like, you know, circular economy for, for carbon cycles. And we have, again, set out an action plan on how to develop this notion of carbon farming uh, and other, you know, sustainable solutions to increase uh, carbon removals. We list short to medium term actions, um, basically, you know, aiming to address current challenges uh, to take up this, this notion of carbon farming and to really try and, and work together to, to, um, to get this new green business model off the ground, uh, whereby the purpose is to reward land managers for the action they undertake that can help uh, to increase carbon sequestration. And then again, as we said in the beginning and throughout this, this intervention, you know, uh, very much keeping also the, uh, the benefits for biodiversity in mind. Now, that communication was like a, a major, um, how shall I say, reflection piece almost. We will have throughout this year a discussion with stakeholders on, on how they see these ideas and, and that will then feed into uh, a, the legal proposal on the certification of carbon removals, because we really are convinced that, you know, we need to be able to uh, put in place, you know, a clear legal framework for what uh, is a good quality carbon removal, how do you go about the accounting uh, to have environmental integrity and to basically also ensure that we have like a level playing field uh, across uh, the EU. Now for us. That is, uh, you know, a first step and, and will be necessary in terms of policy and legal framework to define which uh, types of carbon removal can, can really bring these tangible benefits um, and again, put us on, on the right track. Now, basically, I will end by saying that uh, the decade in front of us is pretty crucial in, in forestry as well as uh, biodiversity issues, and that is why we have indeed under the European Green Deal uh, focused our strategies to look at environmental, social and economic functions of forests and to to build, of course, on, you know, this this concept of um, sustainable forest management. So from our perspective, uh, we hope and, and are more or less confident that, you know, we are in the process of putting in place uh, the necessary measures to to protect biodiversity and to strengthen climate action we do have to be mindful of the fact that land management takes time uh, the soils are going to be restored only slowly uh, planting trees and growing trees doesn't happen overnight um, that's the same in other sectors but probably even more so here so we do need to have always the long-term perspective in mind we we need to uh, incorporate that also in how we design our policy framework. So uh, the aim that we have today, which is uh, to combine, you know, the agricultural uh, emissions and absorptions with the land sector and forestry by 2035, and to really uh, steam ahead towards um, a bigger contribution of the carbon removals to offset emissions in other sectors uh, after 2035, again, to reach climate neutrality by 2050 is our objective, and we hope that we uh, will, with all these different measures, be setting the right signal, you know, for increasing action in agriculture and forestry within 
these overarching, uh, you know, boundaries and, and concepts that are there to protect the climate, our well-being, our economy, which of which biodiversity is certainly a, a very big part. Thanks so much for giving me the time and uh, over to you. Thanks very, thanks very much, Yvonne. Um, you've covered a, a, a large amount of territory there and I think there, I, I see some questions coming in already, but let me turn to our second speaker uh, this afternoon. Uh, Arvid Ozols, as I said, was is director of the forestry department in the Latvian Ministry of Agriculture. Um, he was formerly the chair of the European Forestry Commission, has over 30 years of professional experience in the sector. He holds a degree in forestry engineering from the Latvia University of Agriculture. And uh, Arvid, you have the floor, please. And uh, thank you very much, Yvonne, for this very brief overview. And, and actually, all these components are quite important. But uh, what I will uh, try, try to cover in, in quite a short presentation, these are some points on EU forest strategy. Uh, not to pretending to give complete overview, uh, but uh, just to maybe focus on some challenges ahead. And what you very rightly said is that actually mm, uh, the land use issue and uh, land sector uh, is uh, quite a complex one. And, and also these solutions are not the simple ones. But let me share my, uh, my screen. Uh, and uh, and actually about the long-term perspective and then forest development uh, in Europe. Uh, actually, uh, we, we got uh, forests, uh, what we have now, not that long, uh, at least in scale of geological history. And uh, we have two basic forest zones, boreal forest zone, temperate forest zone, and actually the Latvia is on the board. Uh, if you are looking on, on forest development in quite recent history, which is around uh, 100 years, in the beginning of last century, we had about 27% of forest covered area. What we have now, now we have about 52. And uh, maybe as a short remarks, I will just cover certain things forest strategy because otherwise this introductory remark will be uh, too long. Uh, and uh, about socioeconomic functions of forest, promoting sustainable forest by, by economy for long-lived forest products. Uh, I will a bit come on that, uh, but uh, the keyword here is long-lived. And then we have another target for uh, sustainable use of uh, wood-based resources for bioenergy. Uh, and these have to be somehow combined. Promoting non-wood forest-based bioeconomy, including ecotourism. And, and this is a really interesting point. Uh, we we uh, made uh, some exercises um, uh, trying to establish our national environment account system and also made the studies on uh, non-wood uh, forest-based bioeconomy, uh, and uh, especially studying uh, some of uh, non-wood forest products, which are quite popular, and also uh, services. And the outcomes were really, really very interesting, because uh, one can guess what was the biggest uh, part of non-wood forest product, and these were berries. Uh, and, and a second one, mushrooms. And the value is about 100 million euros per year. But uh, not uh, all of that is uh, for a market. There is quite a lot of traditional self-consumption. Uh, and another, of course, big interest was about hunting. Uh, and uh, people guessed that, okay, this will be a big money. Uh, this was uh, one, one order less than, than uh, berries and mushrooms. And, and, and the really interesting thing was that uh, not the hunting products like, like meat or skins was, was an important part, but services around. Value of services around were uh, about four times more. 
And if you're looking on, uh, on, 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 uh, just like uh, I have this bit better, forestry products just are making around uh, 600 million euros. And, and, and that's quite the money, but uh, what's even more important is that uh, there are a lot of jobs. And uh, this is not only forestry, this is uh, also related infrastructure, transport, and other services to forestry. And if we are uh, looking for uh, the whole value chain, uh, we are willing to look. Is actually that uh, uh, this is creating a much, much higher value and the number of jobs is even much more substantial. And uh, what is even more important from the picture is that actually there is a lot of discussion on how we're going to finance forestry. Uh, a lot of people know and, and, and the answer is that this value added from sustainable forest products is actually creating a money flow to finance forestry. And to make this uh, sustainable forest management also profitable for forest owners under general rules, that they have uh, cover all their obligations to society uh, through forest legislation. And, 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 and actually there is not, uh, not that much public money involved. There is certain money in uh, promoting uh, climate activities uh, or do you right now from a rural development program. Uh, but, but in comparison with overall uh, value added, uh, this is quite a small, small amount of money and target. And, and then we're coming uh, uh, to some challenges, uh, at least from our point of view. Uh, if we are speaking about the bioenergy, the problem is that wood for bioenergy uh, has separate sustainability criteria from uh, sustainable forest management. And, and this is creating one, one challenge and maybe even some stupid questions whether we need uh, another sustainability criteria for lumber or, or, or for furniture or for whatever. And uh, our, our understanding was that actually what we need and this I will come later on, and this is also some points I won't mention, that actually if we can provide uh, the joint understanding and, and criteria and indicators for sustainable forest management, then whatever product is coming out of that, or even service, uh, also uh, shall be uh, sustainable. I understand that also uh, these uh, sustainability criteria are not targeted only at EU forests. Uh, they are targeted worldwide, and, and and therefore, of course, there is a need, as as there is lack uh, internationally of of commonly agreed criteria, indicators, and, and and how you can value is this sustainable or not. But at least in context of EU, it's it's creating some challenge. Uh, and 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 this is what I said, and and, and actually the. Uh, criteria and indicators of sustainable forest management, by the way, are already proposed in a strategy. Uh, another issue is the individual assessment versus risk-based approach. At least uh, according to Red 2, we can use uh, two approaches. Uh, one is individual assessment of uh, source and another is risk-based approach. We actually used in Latvia having uh, external audit uh, going through all our governance systems legislation and, and, and actually uh, showing that uh, we can provide uh, with our uh, legal basis uh, institutional supervision system uh, that the bioenergy produced in Latvia is, is uh, compliant with uh, with red directive and, and therefore should be uh, uh, considered sustainable. And as I issue actually is, I'm sorry to speak on this too much, but, but this will inevitably become quite an important issue uh, due to new geopolitical challenges. Unfortunately, we have them. 
and 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 and, and this will be actually uh, according to our understanding unfortunately very strong turning point for a number of issues uh, at least uh, le in lesser extent very forestry but but other issues especially energy now uh, uh, there will be need for some reconsideration and therefore actually this is quite a recent development but uh, we're a bit 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 puzzled uh, that actually red 2 is not yet completely implemented but uh, we are already getting proposals for red, uh, three uh, promoting non-wood forest based by economy including ecotourism um, actually as i already told we we made such a uh, exercises to have this and, and and de facto this already exists but it lacks full valuation and uh, uh, non-wood forest based by economy uh, we would also like to look on broader perspective uh, these are not only products these are also services uh, because uh, tourism is actually one one kind of such a service uh, but not the only one for example in recent uh, covid period uh, what we, we observed that there is rapidly increasing demand for, for recreation in the forest as in a safe and healthy environment. And uh, even our social infrastructure like the different environment passes and others was actually overloaded. And uh, there is another thing uh, which is coming from forest owners perspective, actually in society, uh, in different countries differently, but there is a perception, perception that these things are for free, given. And therefore not acknowledged as the products and services provided by forest owners to society. And uh, this is actually quite a question on, on valuation on, on ecosystem services. And, and coming to, to some conclusions, actually what's, what's given for society, for example, in Latvia, all forests are uh, free access, uh, even including private ones. A uh, private owner has the rights to restrict certain activities. And, and, and of course, there are general restrictions as a fire safety and other things. But the but general rule is that these uh, forests are freely accessible, uh, including also potentially marketable goods like berries, mushrooms, and other things. So hunting is different issue. Uh, protection, restoration, and enlargement of new forest resources. Actually, uh, there is a lot of questions that we need to protect the uh, youth lost remaining priority and old lost forests, but uh, we still need to agreement on common understanding and agreed definitions. Actually, the Commission is right now working on that. Uh, with, with also member states experts, but, but uh, and another thing is that parameters may differ in different regions due to geographic and climate conditions. Uh, uh, ensuring forest restoration and reinforce sustainable forest management for climate adoption and forest resilience. Uh, here we are actually working on 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 few issues. Uh, and I will have an example <clears throat> because my colleagues have asked me, okay, uh, if we need to restore a forest then, and restoration uh, de facto means that you are restoring something to certain status, to which status we have to restore. Uh, because as, as we saw, uh, if we are restoring to the beginning of last century, then actually we have to min diminish them. And, but I will have one picture explanation on that. And, uh, Ivan uh, mentioned, and uh, unfortunately, I restricted myself, uh, but uh, there is still a question. If you're uh, looking from a climate perspective, there are two very important things. There is a storage of carbon, and, and there is a sink of the carbon. But the dilemma is that uh, storage is not of unlimited capacity. Each ecosystem has uh, its capacity limits. And, and uh, here we had also quite a good research cooperation with a number of EU countries. Uh, and, and the question is, what if the store is full? 
because uh, uh, conservation status, uh, and actually I, I, I bit, uh, hate the word conservation because you cannot conserve nature. Nature will still continue to develop according to its own rules. But uh, I'm, I'm some, sometimes a bit comparing this with a warehouse. Uh, it has certain capacity, goods are coming in, at a certain point, warehouse can be full, and then what to do? And, and the solution, of course, probably is in a wider climate context and a wider uh, circular economy and, and the life cycle uh, context, that actually we uh, can uh, use this uh, biomass as a material, as basically for long long lived forest products. Uh, and, but uh, still uh, in the current uh, agreement on the current LUSF legislation, this is still delayed uh, emission. Of course, it's delayed, but, uh, but uh, actually according to our understanding, the main gain would be if we would include also, and this is already, I think, in a document you mentioned on sustainable carbon cycles, it's it's a replacement effect. Uh, if we can replace uh, fossil materials, whatever we are using for, not only for energy, but, but also chemicals, uh, plastics, whatever, uh, then we are actually coming to the, the, the complete picture of the puzzle, because uh, to achieve climate neutrality in 2050, uh, we can put all our efforts uh, to minimize emissions, and, and this is what we have to do, because even from business perspective, in many cases, emissions means costs, and businesses need to reduce costs, therefore also to reduce emissions, because what you are emitting, this is a waste of resource. Uh, but... Uh, then actually we need also sustainable things. And only uh, putting all this picture together, actually we can uh, find a place where forest and forestry is a solution through further value added chain and through further uh, substitution. Because, uh, sorry to extend on this that much, but, but this is really uh, one very critical point. Uh, actually, in, uh, we, we are, Arvid, uh, running it into some time uh, issues, so... Um, okay, Dr. I, I, will, I will try to run quickly. Okay. Uh, reforestation and financial incentives for forest managers and uh, managers. And, and as this I already said, we are applying. And uh, actually, the definition on sustainable forest management is agreed and has to be taken as a basis. And uh, criterion and indicators for sustainable forest management are established and are in further development. Uh, and, and, and the main precondition is that uh, this work has to be uh, based on the wide agreement. There are also agreements that this is needed. I will not just cite uh, another thing, but this is a, one, one picture I promised. Actually, this case of Latvia, how was the development of forest covered area uh, over the history and, 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 and the earliest data we could find, this is uh, 1772, uh, actually end of 18th century. And, and then we see that actually right now, we have more forests than we have then. Maybe we can put this line back even still, on, and of course we can reach also to this condition and, and back. And another thing is that actually since the beginning of last century, uh, we have increased our forest area 1.9 times, but the standing volume has increased 3.8 times. And, and, and this actually, what does it mean? This all the increase, this is actually stored, stored carbon. The, the, the challenge is how, how far we can draw that line. And here I'm coming back to this uh, issue of, of storage and things. And uh, just a simple picture, but while doing that and increasing that uh, through management of our course, actually we, we were surprised to find that, for example, one of the indicators of biodiversity, like that would find uh, outstanding, um, we, we, are, we are in the top three. There's a question, is this good, this is bad, but, but, but that's a fact. And uh, protection, uh, and uh, 
main dilemma for strategy implementation. Actually, I'm not going to repeat myself and thank you for reminding uh, about timing, but uh, uh, what I would like to add, actually our policy decision should be a research based. And uh, this is one good example of the work of the European Commission uh, where uh, such a, a research results were compiled. Of course, this is not a full compilation, but still quite a good one. And, and, and the main conclusion from that is that uh, still also research community have no, uh, let's say, single or, or several solutions. There are still options we have to explore. Uh, strategic forest monitoring, given you also already mentioned, and, and I'm not going to repeat it, we have several uh, uh, sources in Latvia. Uh, one thing uh, which exists in a number of countries, not all, is uh, strategic statistical forest inventory. Actually, we have around 16,000 sample plots which are remeasured uh, in a five year cycle. And, and, and uh, we have included also biodiversity indicators, additional ones, because basic ones like that would and these are from the beginning. And another thing is that this can provide us very good timeline on the facto land use, because these sample plots are not only in the forest. And uh, actually, two points. Mm, uh, strategic plans for forest. Uh, according to our understanding, also, this should build on, on all the existing ones. Uh, maybe adding, somehow harmonizing, but uh, actually the seminar for development of guidelines for national forest programs under uh, Ministerial Conference, then Ministerial Conference of Protection of Forests in Europe. Now Forest Europe actually is a seminar was in Latvia. And uh, number for most of you member states have them in a bit different formats, but uh, and the last on this remote sensing data are actually excellent and rapidly developing tool for sustainable forest management, but with one precondition, they have to be adequately calibrated with on site measurements. And we have some uh, also not that positive examples where such interpretation actually led to misinterpretation. And uh, here actually we see, and, and our experience is that this sample plot system which already provides timelines, is an excellent calibration tool for remote sensing. And then you can use remote sensing or the part. And some, some, some uh, conclusions, uh, not, not, not the solutions. Uh, the main message is commission has to work in close cooperation with member states because we have quite a lot of knowledge. And, and, and if that's a good agreement, then also it's a precondition for successful implementation. Uh, there is a package of legislative proposals on 55 uh, or dimension, but they are still in discussion process, the same uh, law safe regulation, which directly uh, applies to. And uh, new legislative proposals to come shortly, at least I know that uh, March 23 is a publication date for nature protection. Uh, regulation and, uh, and uh, soil issues are coming. So, so actually, the main challenge is that uh, member states together with commission, we have to create a harmonic picture uh, from these still parts of puzzle. Uh, that's, that's the main challenge. Thank, thank you, thank you very thank much, you, and, and thank you for taking. Uh, thank you, Arvid. I, I, I think uh, people with. Um, uh, interest in forestry in Ireland can only, I think, look with considerable envy at 52% uh, 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 forest coverage, and we must try and find out sometime how um, you, you can achieve that in Latvia. But um, if we could go on just a, another couple of minutes, we're nearly out of time. Um, there are quite a few questions, and if I could direct one from Saiv O'Neill uh, to you, Yvonne, please. Um, uh, Saiv says there's a growing corporate demand for uh, forestry offsets and what measures uh, can the commission propose to set rigorous standards for any offsetting or neutrality claims? Should forestry offsets be reserved for hard to abate sectors like cement and steel, she asks. 
Yeah, that is a very topical question uh, because, of course, the interest of, of companies in this is in principle a, a laudable one in the sense of, you know, how can my company contribute to, uh, to this transition and to becoming climate neutral? It is not an easy one uh, because, um, you know, as I, it was maybe too convoluted when I mentioned in my introduction, you know, the, the quantitative and the qualitative requirements for any carbon removals. And, you know, that you need to have a very, um, you know, clear uh, set of rules for in order to ensure that what we will be or may be counting as, you know, as removals, be they used as offsets for other emissions or not. So depending on which side of the accounting book, do you count it as a plus or, or a minus? Um, that we know what we're talking about. And this is particularly challenging when it comes to, uh, you know, nature, because some of these things, and I think Arvid's uh, slide actually on the development of the forest in Latvia was very clear, uh, it's not always permanent, you know, there, I think you said it, there is no like permanent storage. Um, and, and that makes it rather sensitive, I have to say, you know, because if you put it in your books as, as an offset against an emission, but then, you know, in a certain amount of time that that offset will no longer have the same value because, you know, uh, either the tree has died or, or, you know, there has been a fire or something, the emission is still there. And that is basically what we will try and, and tackle in this uh, legal proposal for certification of carbon removals so that we, we through that, get to uh, a system where we have transparency, we have accountability, and also the more or less certainty that if there is, um, how shall I say, a commercialization of some of these things that, you know, there is a level playing field and we all know, you know, what is the value of these things. Now, currently, I have to say, uh, none of this is allowed, if, if I can call it like that, for example, you know, there are no company targets within Europe huh, on how many uh, emissions people need to reduce. So we also need to be wary of double counting. The member states have their targets, you know, if, if Ireland or Latvia says I have uh, enhanced my carbon removals by X, but the companies also say I have all these you know, bought all these carbon removals or whatever, you know, then where is this counted? You know, is it counted twice? That's not a good idea. So for all of that, we hope to, uh, and it's a, you know, very challenging thing, but uh, again, together, and I would fully agree with Arvids that, you know, we really need to work together uh, on these things, bring in the best expertise, bring in the best knowledge, and hopefully, you know, move beyond uh, what can also easily turn into fairly uh, polemic discussions, you know, oh, well, you just want to, you know, uh, forego your emissions or something. No, I mean, we know we need to become more active when it comes to enhancing uh, carbon removals. We want to incentivize uh, the foresters, the farmers, etc. But, you know, we also need to be open about the fact that, you know, some of these things are not going to be permanent. And how do you then deal with that? So this is our the work cut out for us, at least for the coming year. And then, of course, once the proposal is on the table, we're also going to be discussing it a lot more in the institutions. Yeah, um, there, there was a, quite a similar question from Enda Keen from uh, Tree Metrics Limited on maybe a more commercial perspective. Um, he says that uh, the 16 million EU forest owners are ready to play their part to increase carbon sequestration. But he asks about the, the market, um, you know, when will the owners be able to sell forest carbon credits for capturing additional carbon? So um, challenging yeah, questions, yeah. Yeah, but I think it's the same kind of uh, issue that we're looking at, because yep. as I said, we do want to incentivize the people that are active in these sectors, huh? because we know uh, we, we need it. You know, We need to have massive step up of, of what we can do in terms of carbon removals. Um, so the, the commercialization or the, you know, again, financial incentive is, is an important one there, but it's not uh, immediately ready, I have to say. So what we, when I mentioned the common agricultural policy, it was also to say, let's try to uh, support these actors now to put in place the best possible tools. Because of course, if you have the best possible tools, it will enhance the, the solidity and, and the trust. You know, once we then say, okay, you have your carbon removal calculated this way, monitored this way, 
uh, you know, and, and, and entered into the legal framework in this way, then you will have probably people saying, okay, I put some money into this in order to incentivize these activities, uh, full well knowing that probably, you know, they will have a, a certain uh, end of their, of their lifetime, but okay, we need to see how we deal with that. So um, I'm afraid it's going to be a little bit more work, you know, it's not for uh, tomorrow, but if we, if we uh, roll up our sleeves and we, we work on it together, this is the, this is the common objective we have. Um, the, there's a, a different uh, area raised by Dara Lawler. Um, uh, I should explain that earlier this week, our national newspapers re uh, re reported the publication in Nature, which referred to deforestation in the Amazon and tipping points and, and so on. And um, uh, Dara asks, um, should there be criteria on preventing deforestation included in any future EU trade deals? Should these be built into trade deals on deforestation? Well, I think actually we have uh, so far in our trade deals, we had like more principles based uh, text, you know, saying we, we can look at, you know, the overall numbers that the overall deforestation doesn't increase, etc. But um, I think it's already a while ago, I forget when exactly, but we, in the meantime, we have made a much more concrete proposal, which is uh, our deforestation uh, regulation, whereby we really uh, put forward, you know, due diligence processes to make sure that some of the goods we import have not got this, you know, deforestation in the country of origin attached. So this has made it much, much more tangible and, and concrete and basically uh, prohibiting, you know, uh, import of, of goods that come with a substantial deforestation attached to it. So yes, we're, we're moving from, you know, trying to, to flag this in our in our cooperation and trade agreements to say, look, by now we really need to, because we've unfortunately seen in the past, you know, some perverse effects, notably, I'm sure everybody knows it, you know, our renewable energy targets then have yep. provoked a lot of imports from, you know, all kinds of things, which clearly had, you know, indirect land use change consequences, deforestation consequences. And this is what we want to try and avoid. And that's where, again, we have put forward a legal framework. It's currently also, as many other things in co-decision, but at least the awareness is, is now there. And I, again, it's, it's um, we were talking about cooperation within Europe, but this will be a challenge also in terms of cooperation with third countries and to hopefully uh, also put in place a constructive dialogue there because there are sustainable practices also possible, you know, in third countries, but we need to have an open debate on, on what is needed there also in terms of reassurances. Okay. Look, I, I, I have to apologize to the other people who've put questions because we have trespassed on your on uh, the time we've gone past uh, two o'clock. Um, I'm really very grateful to you, Yvonne Slingberg, and also um, from the European Commission, of course, and Arvid Ozel uh, from, from uh, the, uh, the Ministry uh, of, uh, of Agriculture in Latvia. Thank you very, very much indeed for sharing uh, your thoughts and your expertise uh, with us. And uh, I wish you all a very good day. Thank you and bye bye. Thank you too. And thank you for this opportunity to, to share ideas. And then, as I said, we need further collaboration and, and discussions to find the best, best solutions. Indeed. And we want, to, we want to learn from Latvia as well. Thank you very much indeed.